Good afternoon. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Andrew Schwartz. I'm Senior Vice President for External Relations here. I see a bunch of familiar faces. I see some new faces. I see some extremely new faces in the front row for CSIS. But uh, I can assure you <laughs> this is going to be a, a tr this is an extraordinary event we have here. And I think it offers everybody an opportunity to learn more about what's going on in the Congo. Um, we're very pleased to be hosting this, co-hosting this with our partner, uh, the Holocaust Museum, and of course with the Eastern Congo Initiative. Ben, thank you for putting this together. Um, I also want to recognize Secretary Carson, who's here. Thank you for being here, and we uh, are expecting Senator-elect Boozman later and, and Senator Kerry. Um, thank you for being here today, and with that, uh, I'd like to uh, offer uh, my colleague from the Holocaust Museum, Sarah Bloomfield, uh, to deliver some remarks. Thank you, and thank you all for coming today to this uh, important program. Um, let's hope it's talk and, and more than talk. I wanted just to say a few brief words about why the Holocaust Museum is part of this event today. Uh, as I think most of you know, after the guns of World War II fell silent, the magnitude of the atrocities against civilians in Nazi-occupied territories were eventually revealed, and the systematic murder of six million Jews became an, an undeniable scar on humanity's conscience. The Holocaust teaches us that the unthinkable is indeed thinkable. It was a failure of imagination and a failure of responsibility. Like all genocides, the Holocaust was the result of choices made by individuals, choices by the perpetrators to plan and implement the assaults, and by those who might have helped but did not. And then there were other kinds of decisions, like the ones to hide a Jew, even on penalty to death, or to stand between an orphanage of Rwandan Tutsi children and advancing genocidaires. These choices, these moments when individuals resisted the tide of deliberate violence, prove that there's nothing inevitable about genocide or mass atrocities. As it's often said, silence always aids the perpetrators and harms the victims. Here today, we're facing a new challenge, this time for the present and the future, halting mass violence in Congo, in Eastern Congo. This is violence that we know is due in large part to our failure to respond adequately to genocide in Rwanda. In November 2007, I traveled to Eastern Congo with museum colleagues, and I saw the ravages of destruction everywhere. I met a group of very young boys, some of them barely teenagers, who were in a child demobilization center, having been forcibly abducted to serve in the various militias wrecking havoc throughout the region. I also spoke with several women who shared with me one horrific story of rape and terror after another. At a Women for Women Center in Walungu, I met a young woman named Lucienne, whom I shall never forget. She had been enslaved, raped, and beaten by rebels when she was just 20 years old, and she lived every day in perpetual fear. She was desperate that we should hear her story, and she was desperate that we should tell her story to the world. It's been estimated that over 5 million people have died as a result of the conflict in the Congo. But this is not a crisis already assigned to history, but an ongoing and perilous reality. For some, there's a perception that the complicated issues are just unsolvable, but with so many civilians so painfully vulnerable, we must continue to raise awareness of the crisis and encourage those to, who can to seek ways to resolve it. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, which honors the victims of the Holocaust by trying to prevent such crimes from happening today, welcomes the opportunity to co-host this prestigious panel, organized the, with the belief that we can find better answers to the ongoing challenges and suffering in the Congo. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Jennifer Cook, the director of the Africa program at CSIS. Thanks so much, Sarah, and good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to CSIS and echo Andrew and, and Sarah in saying how pleased we are to co-sponsor this event um, with the Holocaust Museum and with the Eastern Congo Initiative, represented here today by its founder, Ben Affleck. Ben and Sarah, thanks so much. Uh, we're here today to talk about U.S. policy towards the Democratic Republic of Congo, with a particular focus on the enduring conflict and crisis in eastern Congo, the eastern region of the country. Uh, while 
public awareness uh, is increasing. This is still a conflict that has not galvanized the kind of attention uh, that a crisis of this magnitude warrants. It takes place in a region that is vast, remote, difficult to access, a region that has been plagued by decades of insecurity and marginalization. It's complicated conflict with multiple local, regional, and international actors uh, that have really filled a vacuum uh, created by a national government uh, that has been unable and unwilling in many cases to exert any of the legitimate functions of a state in delivering justice, in providing security, uh, or developmental resources. The principal axis of the conflict has been the DRC uh, Armed Forces, known as the FARDC. You'll probably hear a lot of acronyms today. And the uh, FDLR, uh, former, um, which had their origin in the uh, perpetrators of the genocide in Rwanda, who fled into Eastern Congo after 1994. But in, in addition to these two groups, uh, there have been a proliferation of armed groups Many of, benefit, many of whom benefit from what is essentially a violent free-for-all uh, with the region's rich mineral resources providing both motive and means uh, for continuing conflict. Throughout this, civilian populations have borne the brunt, not simply as collateral damage, uh, but also uh, directly targeted by all sides in the conflict, including um, the armed forces of the DRC. Uh, they've been subject to systematic killing, uh, rape and sexual violence on appalling levels, uh, displacement and intimidation. Secretary of State Clinton has spoken out forcefully and frequently about the need to end uh, this culture of impunity, uh, to strengthen civilian protection, particularly uh, against gender-based mm -hmm. violence, uh, and to cut the ties between the mineral trade and, and the conflict. Uh, but I think there is a sense right now that from multiple, multiple reports from the region uh, that current trend lines are not good. Uh, and with a national election uh, in the coming year, the potential for renewed spikes in violence are very real. So we're here today to talk about uh, U.S. policy. Uh, ECI has just released a policy report uh, with recommendations for the U.S. government, and that's serving as a bit of a platform here. But what is the vision for U.S. policy, and what are the priorities that we can and should take going forward? Just one note uh, before concluding. In these kinds of discussions, I think we really need to keep in mind that fundamentally peace and development in DRC is the responsibility of the government in DRC. Uh, this government has often claimed the mantle of sovereignty, but has not always shown the essential commitment to protect and serve its citizens. So how is it that we move this government towards accountability, and what can we do in the interim to curb the, the toll on civilian populations that have really suffered so much? We have just a terrific panel here today. Senator Bozeman has a, has a vote, and so will be joining us late. Senator Kerry will be joining us late to give the wrap-up remarks. Uh, I'm not going to go into detailed introductions, but just to say we have Ben Affleck, act, active, uh, actor, director, activist, founder of the um, Eastern Congo Initiative, uh, really who has thrown his personal dedication and energy uh, behind this, uh, this region of the world with a very uh, tight focus on Eastern Congo. We have Assistant Secretary Johnny Carson, the administration's top diplomat uh, on Africa and a, a very seasoned Africa hand. Uh, we have Tony Gambino, former USAID mission director in Kinshasa, a Congo analyst. He's written many reports on it. And uh, Mvembe Dizalele, we call him our go-to man on Congo, <laughs> of Congolese origin, a really respected analyst on, on uh, the internal dynamics of Congo. So welcome to you all. Uh, I'm going to start out turning to you, uh, Ben, to, say, to ask uh, first kind of what got you uh, into this, what compelled you to this issue, and perhaps talk a little bit about the report. Why is now an important moment that's outlined in the report? Um, hello. Uh, basically, what got me into it was a kind of, um, you know, at one point in my life I sort of came across in the course of reading actually uh, uh, about Sudan. Uh, in a kind of offhand dimension of, of the scale and scope of the uh, what was going on in in Congo in DRC in Eastern Congo, and I was stunned that um, not only was it so tragic, but that I had no idea uh, that it had happened. And I thought if there's something that um, someone with some profile has to legitimately offer to uh, 
an issue like this, it's to raise awareness. And so I started off with the relatively modest goal of you know, just trying to get people to, to listen to me uh, uh, talking about this issue. And as I got involved, you know, I, I just was overwhelmed with the extraordinary people uh, in Eastern Congo who, who were, and in Congo as a whole, who are working to make their country better. And I was also shocked by the extent to which there was a kind of lack of focus and cohesion on the part of um, the various actors who were, uh, you know, meant to be uh, involved with this and making it better. It wasn't for a lack of effort, but it just seemed quite, quite disparate, you know. And I'm, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to. I've been instructed not to uh, go on for very long or make speeches, but I have to say, you know, and I'm mindful of the uh, minds here who are more extraordinary and more experienced than than my own. Um, but I, you know, when you work on something like this for so long, there are a few things that I do really um, want to get into, and then I'll. I'll move right on. Uh, basically, I'm here today because I believe in the Congolese people, and I believe in uh, the power of the American people to affect change um, when we when we kind of put our mind to it. And uh, after traveling throughout the region and, and intensive study and discussions with international and Congolese experts, I really came to recognize and believe that the Congolese can uh, rebuild their own country, and not only that, but that they can prosper. <clears throat> and that's important because it really runs counter to a lot of things you hear about Congo, a lot of things you are, um, and, and that you that you see, and a lot of the ways that some people feel who are in positions of, of influence. You know, in, in my visits, I've witnessed uh, people doing this themselves, but. Um, as was pointed out, I really do feel that time is running out. We have this window of opportunity that's very important, both here in terms of the United States government and also in terms of what's happening uh, in the next year before the election in Congo. And, uh, you know, Congo's on this tipping point right now. Uh, it could very easily uh, fall back into chaos or it could move forward into recovery. And that gives me and, and others, I think, a sense of, of real urgency. Uh, about this, you know, and, and the United States, I think, could have a critical leadership role to play that would uh, you know, have a great deal to do with with changing the lives of tens, if not hundreds, of millions of people for generations uh, uh, to come. And I founded the Eastern Congo Initiative as an effort to work with the Congolese uh, people doing grant making and, and and advocacy. And as grant makers, we work to support civil society. We kind of uh, seek out and and vet and uh, fund folks who are working to protect vulnerable civilians, both you know. Uh, survivors of sexual-based violence or, or child soldiers. <clears throat> we also work with individuals looking for economic opportunity, uh, uh, working in education, uh, capacity building, and, and legal reform. You know, and in terms of um, you know this paper, it's hard to sort of try to uh, define it quickly. But I think you know it's basically about our belief that we need to refocus on urgent priorities, harmonize the efforts in which the U.S. is poised to take a real leadership role, and to synchronize and, and synergize uh, the efforts of governments, NGOs, and, and the Congolese. Um, you know, it's, it's a big deal. You'll, you'll hear more about these elections and how important it is. You know, there's a lot of rancor uh, and, and anger in, uh, around elections in what we like to think of as stable democracies, like, like our own. Uh, so imagine what it's like, you know, in a nascent democracy that's that's still recovering from uh, uh, ongoing humanitarian conflict, atrocities, political crises. You know, D DRC is the eighth poorest country in the world. It is the uh, fifth on the failed state index, worse than Afghanistan and Iraq and, and Haiti. And failure here really genuinely, honestly, could be uh, catastrophic, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm looking forward to hearing what the other uh, panelists have to say. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'm really grateful to be here, and I want to extend my thanks to Jennifer Cook and Michael Abramowitz and uh, Bridget Conley Zilick and uh, my fellow panelists, who I'll also thank at the end. So I won't go. Just get to <laughs> thank you, Ben, and we'll co we'll come back, I think, to, to the uh, the idea of civil society in the Eastern Congo. Um, Johnny, I wondered if you might uh, say a word about the priorities going ahead. Obviously, we've been engaged a long time in Eastern Congo. Uh, there is this kind of critical moment with the elections coming up. What what may be new uh, will we see, and, and kind of how do you assess the trend lines in Eastern Congo at this point? What will be our priorities going forward in the coming year? Uh, Jennifer, thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of this uh, panel this afternoon. And I want to start by uh, thanking Ben uh, for his contribution to raising the uh, international and public uh, profile on the uh, traumas uh, and uh, 
dangers uh, and uh, civil unrest that continues to persist uh, in the eastern Congo. I think it is extraordinarily important uh, that uh, the international community, our own community in the United States, uh, be aware uh, of uh, what is happening out there. And every voice uh, that sends a message of concern uh, helps to awaken uh, those who need to take action to address those challenges. Let me first of all say that the uh, Congo is an extraordinarily uh, important place. Am I not uh, resonating very clear clearly? The Congo is an extraordinarily uh, important place. Uh, it is a, a large, uh, complex, uh, and difficult uh, political and economic environment that defies uh, easy, quick solutions. Uh, it is a country uh, that we have to constantly uh, engage. Uh, the trend lines uh, in the Congo uh, are neither uh, up uh, or down. Uh, they are decidedly uh, mixed. Uh, over the last uh, year, uh, we have, in fact, uh, seen some good progress uh, in various things uh, uh, in uh, the Congo. Uh, we've seen uh, a country uh, 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 achieve HIPAA status. Uh, we've seen it uh, achieve Paris Club uh, status. Uh, we've seen it uh, agree uh, to uh, the uh, mixed courts uh, that have been suggested uh, by the international community that would bring in uh, international uh, lawyers uh, to work along Congolese uh, lawyers. We've seen the uh, arrest uh, of some uh, military officers and policemen who have perpetrated uh, violence uh, against uh, civil society leaders uh, and uh, women. Uh, and we've seen a successful transition uh, from uh, Monuk uh, to Minusku uh, and seen uh, a commitment by the government of the Congo to hold elections, uh, national elections, uh, in uh, November of 2011. All of these things uh, represent uh, signs of progress. But in the face of those signs of progress, uh, we still see uh, very uh, disturbing uh, trend lines. Uh, over the uh, last uh, three years, uh, we have seen a continuing rise uh, in uh, the number of rapes uh, of women uh, in the uh, eastern uh, Congo. Uh, this last year, that number was approximately 17,000, uh, which in, is in itself uh, an enormously disturbing uh, number in any kind of, uh, of, of a context. Uh, we have seen the continued uh, activities of uh, the, the FDLR uh, and rebel groups uh, operating uh, in the East. We have seen continued uh, bad behavior uh, by the FARDC, members of the uh, Congolese uh, armed forces. We've seen the newspaper accounts uh, of dozens and dozens of women in a single village uh, being uh, raped uh, over uh, a single uh, weekend. And we've seen uh, the continued uh, deprivation uh, carried out by the Lord's Resistance uh, Army uh, in the North Kivus and in the Garamba uh, forest uh, area. All of these things are very uh, disturbing. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, we are, uh, uh, as a government, uh, deeply, con deeply concerned. Uh, remain deeply uh, engaged. Uh, last year, uh, directly, uh, bilaterally, and multilaterally, the United States government uh, put something in the neighborhood of $900 million uh, into uh, humanitarian uh, and development uh, assistance uh, for the Congo uh, to support uh, not only uh, efforts to improve uh, human rights, but also to jumpstart the economy uh, and to carry out uh, economic uh, development uh, projects. Uh, we put uh, millions of dollars uh, into HIV and AIDS prevention, uh, into uh, child survival uh, programs, uh, and into malaria prevention uh, efforts. Uh, we have uh, also uh, aggressively worked on human rights issues. Uh, working with uh, international NGOs, 
uh, to uh, help uh, to uh, both prevent, uh, treat, and reintegrate uh, the large number of women uh, who have been the object of sexual and gender-based uh, violence. Uh, we uh, have uh, worked uh, on the medical side uh, with uh, NGOs, but we've also uh, worked on the governance, uh, justice, and security side. Uh, we've trained more uh, Congolese women as police officers. Uh, we've increased the number of uh, uh, judges uh, within the uh, armed forces of the Congo. Uh, we have uh, instituted, uh, with the help of the government, uh, mandatory uh, training uh, for uh, soldiers uh, coming into the military to receive uh, educational uh, and awareness training on gender-based violence uh, and uh, human rights, making this a uh, part of their uh, standard uh, training. Uh, and we uh, continue to work with the uh, government uh, of the Congo uh, to introduce uh, mixed courts in which we would bring in outside international judges to work along uh, Cong Congolese judges uh, to uh, try people uh, for uh, crimes. And we continue to press hard uh, uh, for the government to uh, arrest uh, uh, and, uh, and try, prosecute, and imprison uh, those individuals responsible for human rights uh, violence. We take this issue uh, very seriously. Many of you know uh, that uh, Senator, uh, Senator uh, uh, Secretary of State uh, Clinton, uh, on her first trip to, uh, to Africa in August uh, of 2009, uh, not only went uh, to the uh, uh, Congo, uh, to Kinshasa, but also out to Goma itself uh, to underscore her deep concern uh, about the violence occurring uh, in the eastern part of, the, uh, of that area. I myself uh, have uh, been to the Congo twice uh, in the last uh, 15 months and have met uh, with President Kabila uh, on three separate occasions uh, within the last 16 uh, months. Uh, and in each of those uh, conversations and meetings uh, with him, uh, the issues of the Eastern Congo, the continued uh, unrest, uh, and the continued uh, the deprivations against uh, women uh, and children uh, has been a, a part of that uh, conversation. Uh, we will continue to uh, focus on this country. Uh, it is indeed one of Africa's uh, resource-rich uh, country, a country which has enormous uh, potential and promise. Uh, much of it uh, has not uh, even begun uh, to be realized. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Carson. I'd like to come back in a bit to, to the election issue and, and election sure. preparation, but I'm going to turn to Mvembe. Uh, Dizalele, um, to talk a little bit about the responsibility of the government of DRC in this and, and how you assess um, their progress and their commitment uh, to resolution in, in the East um, and empowering uh, the citizens of Eastern Congo. Vembe, if you could press again. Uh, thank you, uh, Jennifer, uh, for hosting this, and thank you, Ben, and thank you for the Holocaust uh, Museum for organizing this. The, the challenge, first and foremost, I think, for the DRC at this point is the narrative. Um, you know, we just spoke about Congo, but we pretty much spoke about Eastern Congo. So in many ways, the narrative has been so screwed over time that you think if you talk about the DRC, it means Eastern Congo. Um, it's almost thinking like you're talking about Kashmir, and then you equate that to India or to Pakistan. You know? So we need to reverse that because we need a new perspective in looking at this conflict, uh, because misdiagnosing a problem will never lead to a solution, unless we stumble into the solution. So to go back to that, what does that mean in terms of the government? You know, Eastern Congo represents roughly, depending on what you consider East, if you're considering only the Kivus, uh, maybe 10% of the country, maybe 15 or 20, I might be exact, but it's not half of the country. It's maybe at best a quarter of the country. Um, so if we're going to base our policies based on the code of the country, there's a chunk of the country that is not at war. 
which often is actually in the worse condition than the part that is at war. This doesn't mean that I'm minimizing the sexual violence. I've covered sexual violence, I've covered the war there, it's pretty gruesome. But when we miss the story that's happening in 80% of the country, then we miss the picture. Because what's happening in the East is happening exactly because of what is not happening in the rest of the country, i.e. the government. So the government has not, I think if you go back to 2006 or 2003 even when we all had a lot of hope. We thought, uh, okay, we'll settle for the, less, the lesser evil of the transition. We're going to have a pl one plus four, um, which meant President Kabila would come to power after his father's death, uh, working with four vice presidents. They will somehow raise, you know, rise to the occasion and sh shepherd this country into uh, where it needs to be. The elections came. Uh, the hope were dashed very quickly because we legitimize a regime that is still there today, which is not attentive to the needs of the people, security being one of them. And of course, security, the tip of that spear is the East, but it's not only Eastern problem. Insecurity is a problem across the country, uh, especially when you consider the basic needs, the basic services that the government needs to, to provide, namely, civil and human rights that are not provided. Uh, so when police is not rightly integrated, you know, law enforcement and security apparatuses. So let's take the military. I, I heard the Assistant Secretary mention the FAR DC. This is another part of the, the screwed narrative. When we talk about the FAR DC as the Congolese army, uh, what does that mean? Uh, there's no such thing as the Congolese army. There is a conglomerate, if you will, a consortium, a patchwork of former militia groups that call themselves the FARDC. So if we go back to the Kivus and you find people should be held in the International Criminal Court or even the, the courts in Kinshasa, people like Bosco Taganda, people are wanted, people like Kunda and others who are allowed to wear the Congolese uniform. We keep them in the same place. We don't push for security reform. The government doesn't push for it that seriously because the government feels that they have to make all these deals to keep peace. If these people were raping yesterday when they were calling themselves CNDP or whatever my, my group they call themselves, and then tomorrow you give them a rank up and they become the FARDC, but you keep them in the same place, no indoctrination to, to change their view, what you get, you get the same result. Except now when the press covers it, they will say it's the far DC. But that's a joke, really a tragic comedy that we need to stop. Uh, the elections, you know, Congolese are eager to, uh, to move forward. Um, they work hard. It's all, it doesn't always come true when you read the reports. Uh, we got to the elections in 2006 because the Congolese wanted the elections. Uh, it's not because the international community. The Congolese forced the international community to hold the elections. Um, now we're going to the next cycle of elections. So we've had about four years of observing what we thought could be and what has been and what is. And it's not a pretty picture, right? So we have human rights activists being killed. We have journalists who are being killed. Women continue to be raped. The government is happy to deal with NGOs, right? So if ECI, Oxfam, just to name a few, come and say, we'll feed these people, if you're in Kinshasa, you say, fine, be my guest, right? So they're not doing their job. That's on one side. So the government has failed. But the other side that is more even dangerous, I'll just close here, and we come back to it, is that the most critical point at this time is the elections that are supposed to take place next year. If we screw up this election again, then Congo is set for tremendous calamities that we've not even been able to imagine because the danger is that in the international community, the government, for some reason, has managed to convince people they are the only alternative. So you hear people tell you that we don't see another alternative, Kabila. Well, that's the biggest BS that there is, because it's not about finding the alternative. It's about creating a system that will set the democratic process moving. Thank you.
Thanks, Mvemba. I think we will come back um, to uh, the the election and, and how, to, how to empower the Congolese people um, to make those choices. Tony, I want to turn to you, kind of what's missing from this? You've heard the presentations. What, how would you place the priorities? I know you've talked a lot about the elections um, uh, coming forward, and you've done a lot of work on the security sector as well, which uh, uh, Tony br uh, um, uh, Mvembe brought up as well. You want to um, talk about what's, what, what, how would you rank the priorities going forward? Thank you very much, Jennifer. I will indeed talk about both those points. Uh, first, of course, I'm going to thank you and, and thank Ben Affleck and the Holocaust Museum for holding this event. It's great to see a full house of people thinking about the Congo. It should happen more than it does. I was very struck by what Sarah said at the beginning, that the Congo is a crisis not yet consigned to history. So we can look right now in real time and think about what we are doing, what we can be doing, what we should be doing about the situation. So let me talk about two issues, sexual violence in Eastern Congo and the elections. First on sexual violence, I don't think there can be any question that Secretary Clinton was deeply moved during her trip to Congo last year and is committed to doing something about it. She said as recently as just a few months ago in August, that the United States will do everything we can to create a safe environment for women, girls, and all civilians living in Eastern Congo. Everything we can, Secretary said in late August. And Sec Assistant Secretary Carson just sketched out some of the many programs that the United States has in place to try to deal with this horror of violence against civilians in Eastern Congo. Yet, Observers agree that the situation today is no better, might be worse, than when Secretary Clinton visited over a year ago. So something is going badly wrong. What is the problem? I think the problem comes from some of the points that Mvemba Dizolele just made. There's a new report out by the United Nations, a group of experts just released and that report details compellingly that what is called the Congolese army is actually, as the report states, a mafia-like network of individuals who are looking to exploit the riches of the various mines and minerals that are everywhere in Eastern Congo. And based on that competition, they then go forward and commit horrible abuses against civilians, including the rapes, the gender-based violence, and all the other things that people know about. For the last couple of years, the United Nations, through its mission, MONUC, decided that it would try to make things better by collaborating with this so-called army. I think even with my short description, you can imagine what the results were. The results were terrible. The abuses didn't get better, they actually got worse. Luckily, the new UN mission, now renamed MONUSCO, is under the leadership of a distinguished American diplomat named Roger Meese, who knows the, uh, the Congo very well, now the head of the UN mission. And under his leadership over the last few months, MONUSCO has started to take unilateral action against abusers in particular places in the regions of Eastern Congo where the violence is occurring. It is this step-by-step -step action to ultimately break the back of this mafia network that will get us to the position where we get the result that we have to have, which is a reduction in the scale of violence. It's important, of course, to have all the programs that the U.S. and others have put into place to respond to the needs of victims, but we have to stop the violence. And this is what I hope Roger Meeson, his new role, new role, is now working on. Now a few sentences on elections. In 2006, as Mvemba said, the Congolese people and the international community really came together to organize what were reasonably free and fair elections. Mvemba and I were both observers of those elections. 2011 will require a similar effort. Preparations are underway, but so far they're halting. And as others have said, the preparations so far do not bode well. And here, the United States, I'm sorry to say, really hasn't stepped up yet. 
Even in the context of a $900 million program, the U.S. intends to provide roughly $5 million for elections in the Congo. It is estimated that the international community needs to provide $300 million for these elections. A reasonable contribution by the United States would be more on the order of $50 million rather than five. And frankly, if we stay at this low level, it will undercut the ability of skilled diplomats like Assistant Secretary Carson and others to push for the kinds of free and fair elections that the Congolese people must have to get to the kind of progress that is necessary. Um, thank you, Tony. Assistant Secretary Carson, I, I wonder if you might say something about the UN role and the broader international community. Um, and uh, Ben talked a little bit about the disparate nature of, of efforts. And um, I wonder if you might say a bit on, on the security and, again, the elections coming up, how, how the international community is, is coordinating or coming together or focus on other uh, global problems right now. No, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, it seems counterintuitive to say that, uh, indeed, if you look back uh, a year ago uh, to the Congo, uh, that you would then be looking forward today and saying that, uh, in fact, uh, on the issue of elections and UN presence, that things are a lot more stable and a lot more optimistic than they were just uh, a year ago. Let me just recall uh, for all of you uh, how difficult a situation we were in just uh, one year ago. Uh, when I uh, traveled out to the Congo, uh, at that point, uh, we were very deeply concerned that President Kabila, uh, in the run-up to the 50th anniversary of the Congo independence, was not talking about a renewal of the UN mandate. He was talking about a withdrawal of the entire UN apparatus. Uh, at 50 years of independence, uh, he said to me, uh, as he had said to others, that after 50 years, it was time for the UN to leave, and that he wanted that process uh, to begin uh, as a part of the country's 50th anniversary. Many th people thought that we were uh, in for a major clash between the Congo's desire to see an essential UN presence leave uh, and the UN Security Council's desire and our desire, Washington's desire, uh, to see uh, the UN remain in place. Equally, uh, a year ago, uh, there was some concern uh, that the elections for uh, November 2011 would not, in fact, happen at all. Uh, the uh, number one challenger uh, to uh, Kabila uh, was now uh, in The Hague uh, under uh, a warrant and indictment from the ICC, uh, and that, in fact, uh, elections uh, might not uh, be held in 2011, or for that matter, might not be held uh, at all. And there was a concern that 2011 would come and we would see no national elections no presidential elections, and no administrative elections. As we all sit here today uh, talking about how bad the situation in the Congo is, and it is genuinely bad, and the Eastern Congo uh, is uh, indeed a, uh, uh, a hugely difficult problem, today we see uh, a transformed uh, UN presence that is absolutely essential for the security uh, that exists uh, in parts of the Eastern Congo, absolutely essential if we are to have uh, elections in 2011. Uh, we've seen uh, MONUC become MONUSCU. We've seen a declining level of anti-UN rhetoric from the capital, and we've seen the insertion, uh, as uh, has been noted, of a very talented uh, and uh, skilled diplomat, Roger Meese, inserted uh, as the uh, special representative. And we've seen some new initiatives out of that UN presence. And we also have and see a commitment, a commitment that uh, President Kabila has made privately to a number of people, including myself, 
uh, and also publicly uh, to people in his own country that he is committed to holding the elections. One last thought, uh, uh, and I think that uh, Tony is absolutely right uh, about uh, the need uh, for us in the United States to uh, put uh, money behind our most important <laughs> principle, and that is the support for the strengthening of democratic institutions, including the holding of elections. But uh, we also have to realize uh, that this is an issue uh, that uh, requires a commitment on the part of the political leadership of the Congo, President Kabila, the people of the Congo, but also the tremendous international uh, support that's required. The elections in 2006 in the Congo would not have occurred if, in fact, the UN had not played such an overwhelming and dominant role. Uh, there were some uh, 270 uh, or more uh, air sorties moving uh, uh, fixed wing and rotary uh, equipment across the country uh, to provide the ballot boxes, uh, the election officials, and the observers to make that happen. Uh, people also forget uh, that there was not only uh, a uh, Monuk force on the ground, uh, but the European community, led by uh, the Germans, also had a special military mission there during that election. Uh, the Congo uh, is an enormously large uh, and complex place. Uh, and while the problems of the East uh, are dramatic, uh, uh, are in dramatic relief because of the sexual and gender-based violence and the continued uh, uh, hostility, this is a country, this is a country uh, that has uh, fewer uh, roads uh, today than it had uh, in 1960. It has fewer regional airports that are functioning today uh, than it had uh, in uh, 1960. This is a country that generates less uh, electricity uh, today uh, than it did uh, in 1960. And while there is no doubt uh, that interconnectivity because of the cell phone uh, dramatically uh, shortens the distance uh, uh, digitally, uh, in many ways uh, the uh, infrastructure that is required for the country to move ahead politically and economically and to have the kind of strong democratic institutions that we all want to see is still far, far, far uh, behind what it is. We are committed. Uh, it's important. But we also uh, must ensure uh, that there is the, the kind of commitment uh, in and among the leadership there and in the international community. And again, I think this is why, uh, again, a program like this is so important. I think, again, Ben and the, and the, the Holocaust Museum and others have to be uh, applauded because it does elevate uh, the level of concern. It elevates the level of attention. Uh, and it shows uh, that it's not just uh, the people who are suffering in the Congo uh, who are concerned, but the international community and a large group of people uh, in the United States uh, share that concern as well. Thank you, Johnny. Um, I, I think it is important to point out the progress that's made. And in fact, the ECI report um, it makes fairly clear there's something to build on here. And there's a certain uh, hopefulness in that report, and I think in the creation of ECI itself. Uh, maybe you want to say a yeah. word on that. I think it's a really important point, and I hope it, it gets across, because it's relevant to um, this whole notion that things uh, can be improved and can be supported, and most importantly that um, improvements are ultimately, at this point, I believe, another, uh, are, are led by the Congolese. You can't it can't happen without the people there doing it, and they, they have been doing it, and they're quite capable. You've seen the expansion of state institutions dramatically since the elections in, in 2006. Um, they've developed a framework for reintegration of, of 2 million internally displaced persons and refugees. Um, you see the peace process uh, happening actively. Some of the groups, remember, talked about CNDP, FDLR, you know, RUD, Perico. There were 22 recognized armed groups at the Goma Peace Accords. Now, granted, Goma wasn't particularly successful, but March 23 uh, was. And you've had a lot of these. And it, it's a double-edged sword, again, as you pointed out. I mean, you have these, these 
folks out there. They're warring. And, uh, you know, this goes back to, like, the Himalendu conflict, where you say, well, these are brutal, terrible guys. You know, Cobra, Matata, and others like them. But in order to get them to stop fighting, we're going to make them colonels in the FARDC. And it's, like, the worst possible thing you could do except leave them fighting. Uh, and, and, and so it's, you know, they're facing tough choices. Now, you know, the, the, in terms of Kinshasa's... Uh, a relationship to these, I, I think it's an incredibly salient point to recognize the difference between the East and the rest of the country. It's, uh, Kinshasa is unrecognizable from parts of the East, and it's and the uh, it's very politically complicated. And others at this panel are better suited to talk about that. But I do think <clears throat> that that one of the relationships between Kinshasa and the East has to do with the way the peace process is managed and has to do with whether Bosco and Tanganda is going to be incorporated into CNDP and how they're going to cooperate with the Rwandans in terms of this joint military exercise. And um, as those decisions get made, I think we, um, we have a place in terms of levering uh, our interests uh, and, and exercising influence on President Kabila, which it sounds like Secretary Carson has been involved with uh, doing. I think the um, FRDC speaks, that, that issue and the concern about them speak to what the, the paper speaks to, which is this notion that you have to do systemic change. You have to address, uh, every, everybody will tell you, well, the FRDC guys have to be garrisoned. They have to be paid. Many of them travel, they travel, they walk sometimes, you know, 800 miles to where they're being assigned. It's like Rome, you know, uh, like legionnaires, except the uniforms don't look as good because oftentimes they're just throwing them on over the old CNDP uniforms or whatever. And this, um, ha having them be unpaid, ha having them be not garrisoned, means that, you know, they're basically uh, sustaining themselves on the back of the population, which is why you see statistics like 40 percent of the sexual-based violence comes from FRDC. A large part also comes from FDLR, granted, and the, and the cooperation between, um, you know, the FRDC and the UN or trying to root out the FDLR is tricky and complicated because it's created a lot of ancillary, uh, you know, uh, human costs. I think, um, you know, the, the thing that's really um, hopeful about this is that you've seen progress happen in the past and that uh, we contend, and I believe, that the vast majority of what can be done from outside the country, particularly in the, uh, from the U.S. government, doesn't require a huge amount of new funding. Uh, you brought up some of the gaps in funding that exists now that's already allocated. There's eight million dollars supposed to go to an IDP resettle, uh, eighty million supposed to go to a program for resettling IDPs. Only eight has been has actually uh, arrived. There's there's some of those issues going, and there is some underfunding. But for the most part, um, you know, it, the United States government can do more because the lion's share of the work necessary to engage in the region to prevent a collapse and to ensure that real change happens. Um, you know is about priority, cohesion, and the focus of existing manpower, diplomacy, and, and, and dollars. You know, it, and I think that, that is something that's really possible. I think we've seen um, that it's possible to affect change because the Congolese are doing it, as you point out, they have been doing it. So it's, it's certainly not hopeless. Going to, to the, um, this question of empowering civilians, Mbembe, do you want to say something about how Eastern Congo will fare in the election process? And perhaps uh, <laughs> Tony? Or uh, Assistant, uh, Secretary Carson come back and ha do they get a, a voice in the national um, framework? Well, thanks, Tony. Eastern Congo is has been for the last few years very critical in the electoral process, the democratic process. Often, Eastern Congo, it's it's about what it's like the book What's Wrong with Kansas, you know, <laughs> in in many ways when you try to understand. Eastern Congo. So on one level, you say, if we go back to 2006, when I was covering the conflict and the election, I remember interviewing people in the, in, in the West, and nobody could stand Kabila. They hated the guy. They saw him as a, a militia leader, incompetent, and all that. I arrived in the East, and everybody said, this is our savior. He's great. We love him. He's our son. And I said, well, what do you say to your fellow men or your countrymen in, in, in Bandundu in the West? They say, well, they don't quite understand. And then I say, so how is he your savior if your women are being raped? Uh, these are really your cousins, you know. They are my fellow countrymen, but they are your sisters and your cousins. Uh, if you cannot go to the field and, and till the land so you can feed yourself. Yeah, but you need to understand. Anyway, they give you long stories that to a lot of us didn't make any sense. In the end, it's the East that carried Kabila to power, not the West. Uh, now, so you have this ebb and flow where 
they will say he's not popular anymore. We don't like him because he's not kept his word. He, he brought the Rwandans for Umoja One, Am Amani Leo, and all these operations that cause more chaos. But in the end, it's very hard to predict. It's very hard to predict because the people in the East are the most, unfortunately, I don't know if the word manipulate, uh, easy to manipulate is right, but I think they've been caught in this war economy with the various layers, and that's what I was saying. Congo is a political issue. We need to solve that to untangle the crisis in the East, which is a humanitarian crisis as a consequence of the larger political crisis. So if you're in war, if you're in Bukavu, literally in Bukavu, the economy in Bukavu is much better than the, the economy in Bandaka. So in many ways, the person who lives in Bukavu doesn't feel the sting of the war. If you live in Walungu, in the villages, you feel it. In Bukavu, a hotel room costs as much as the Holiday Inn. There's economic boom, people are building, people have jobs because of you know, the grant and all these things. So it's good, they're helping these people. But these people also get confused in that circle. Where on one level they say, we don't want, we hate these UN people. But on the other hand, if the UN left Congo, people in Bandung do not give a damn. It doesn't affect their life. It affects the life in Bukavu. And that tied to how they see Kabila. I really don't know what's going to happen during the election because the East is very fickle. Yeah, I'll, I'll say something about that, too. The first thing is, how will we know if elections in November 2011 are good or not? What's the standard? It seems to me there are two, three, two clear things to watch. The first is, are they at least as free and fair as the elections were in 2006? This is Secretary Carson has already talked a little bit about how hard it was to even make that happen. That sort of sets the floor. We have to do at least that well, arguably better. The second is that elections have to be about a choice. And so at the presidential level, that implies that there's at least one other credible national candidate to compete against President Kabila, who is, uh, uh, President Kabila is clearly running. Uh, we have uh, one other uh, stated challenger. We'll have to see whether there are more to see whether it adds up to a clear choice for the Congolese people. Then in that context, particularly talking about Eastern Congo, there, there are going to be two huge things to worry about. One, which extends to the whole country, are the logistical problems that Assistant Secretary Carson talked about. They're just as bad in 2011 as they were in 2006. And there's no other plausible actor to do things like transporting ballots and things like that than the UN mission, MONUSCO. So they're going to have to play some important role in that. And I hope that planning has already begun because now's the time to do that. The second and more complex one is security. And that might seem hopeless. But now think back to 2006. In 2006, there was a very fragile agreement among people who had been warring. And the various groups weren't even integrated into a national army, even in the loose way that Mvemba talked about earlier. There were warlords running all around Eastern Congo in the way that they're doing today. Yet, the UN, because it was so serious about the elections, went in and village by village, militia by militia, had a good talk with some of those leaders and about how important it was that they, that they left their space for campaigning, for civilian action, and ultimately for voting. And on election day in some of the most violent parts of Eastern Congo, where I was an observer, there was not a single act of violence committed against civilians in 2006, not a single one. That will require in 2011, again, an enormous effort led by the United Nations mission with strong <coughs> diplomacy from the United States and others to think about how does this unruly group of mafia-like warlords calm down so that people can compete peacefully in an electoral context. It won't be easy, but for those of you who think it's impossible, I want to stress it worked in 2006 with a similar effort. It can happen again in 2011. Uh, Sister Secretary Carson, do you see an appetite for that same kind of international effort, uh, German-led, the EU mission, 
African Union playing a role, the UN, which is already coming under some constraints? I think that it's important uh, not to step back from our responsibilities and, and, and obligations, and those responsibilities and obligations are to do as much as we possibly can in association and collaboration with the government of the Congo uh, and the international community to, to, to support elections. Uh, we all have to recognize that this uh, is a different uh, economic environment, uh, it's a different political environment, and it's a different international environment uh, than it was uh, five years ago. And in all of those areas, uh, it's a little bit more uh, difficult, harsh, uh, and complicated. Uh, but uh, it is still uh, an obligation and a responsibility uh, to do as much as we can to support the democratic institutions, nascent, fledgling, uh, as they are, and to push ahead to try and do this. It is going to take a, a, an enormous uh, effort. But we do start at one place, which I think is absolutely critical. And I think we need to constantly uh, get reaffirmation and support for it. And that is the commitment of President Kabila uh, and his government to hold the elections in November of 2011. Uh, we have to uh, not only uh, make uh, that uh, a stated uh, commitment, but one that he is committed to fulfilling. Uh, we have to make uh, the Congolese uh, who are a part of it uh, believe it uh, and believe in it. Uh, and we have to find the international support uh, to help uh, realize it, including the enormous international commitment uh, that's absolutely essential uh, to make it work. But it starts with at least that commitment. And I go back to a year ago, uh, a year and a half ago, uh, when there was a deep concern uh, across the international community uh, that we would in fact see no elections at all. Um, on, uh, 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 I'd, I'd like to say, uh, but you talked about the economic crisis. I think the U.S. and the incoming Congress is going to have deep preoccupations with domestic issues, major uh, global challenges. I know you've been um, advocating, I think you're having conversations with congressional staff. I mean, do you see this is traditionally not been uh, an issue that has fallen prey to partisan differences. I think there's really been bipartisan support for peacekeeping um, initiatives um, and support for the Congo. Congress people have, uh, have responded. Uh, a senator like Boozman, I think, was going to be here to uh, say his piece has gotten caught, in up, caught up in votes. Um, but I wonder, going forward, um, we have a Republican senator and a Democratic senator that are not here, so that's bipartisanship <laughs> for you. Right? But they're meant to be here. <laughs> no, take the wrong. Yes, Senator Kerry's coming, and Boozman isn't a vote. Just a joke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. be, yeah, be careful what you joke about. I know, in this town. I know. I know. <laughs> it's worse than Hollywood. <laughs> Um, but you have seen congressional action, particularly, for example, on the, on the uh, conflict minerals and the State Department's initiative and congressional interest in that. I wonder, in your conversations with Congolese, that conflict minerals issue, has that, has, uh, currently, Kabila has responded in a way with a ban on, on production, which is causing hardships at the time. Yeah, I, I think it's a really tricky issue. Uh, it's not one that I am completely expert in, except for my, the people that I've talked to. Um, Kabila's approach, um, well, I should say that, you know, I've got a different impression on this issue from being here and from being in, in, in DRC. Um, there's a sense from outside that this is like, you know, this is the FDLR and they're sitting on these minerals and they're um, taking them and that's fueling a lot of the, what, this, what's happening there. And I think that's part of it. But one of the things that people told me, including people in the administration and in the government and in the military said, well, you know, this is really a lot of this minerals are... Um, uh, being used by a sort of quasi-mafia army group of elite guys, I guess you call them elite, who uh, are controlling huge amount of this resource extraction. And you can drive through Goma and they say, okay, you know, there's some mansion over here and you go, that's a colonel's house, that's a uh, so-and-so's house. So, so it's even more complicated than just 
uh, bad guys controlling minds and you know it's teenagers with AK-47s. It's it's an institutional issue as well, um, and that that awareness extends to to Kinshasa. And I think it's one of the things that makes it more complicated. Even in the recent you know joint um, operations with the with the UN and the FRDC, they, some of these guys were moved off off um, you know mines. Uh, so one wonders, well, what was the real goal of this operation? Uh, it re the resources are obviously it does. It's, it's not making it better. It's fueling this war economy. Um, these resources belong to the people of the DRC. I mean, this is, this is a country with spectacular, you know, the tin, cassiterite, coal tan, it, it, uh, gold, copper. Um, these things are worth an enormous amount of money. And, and in some of these areas, they have the world's largest reserves of them. Um, they have in lumber. I mean, the charcoal trade is actually a, a, a big deal. So. This one of the biggest crimes to me about the resources is that they're being taken away from the country, from the people themselves who should be sustaining themselves and their economy on this. That's who the theft is from. Um, it, it's it's not unlike the you know the sort of tragic fact that the Congo River's got enough hydroponic power to to light up all of um, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and it's woefully obviously it's not hardly utilized at all. So. Um, in conflict minerals, there's a lot of approaches to it. It's, it's a very tricky thing to figure out how to solve because I think there are a lot of places that um, influence needs to be applied. But to my eye, uh, it speaks to, again, <clears throat> what's talked about in this paper, which is like deep systemic problems that need to be addressed at the root um, uh, to, be, to make the biggest difference. Although it doesn't mean that addressing it other ways won't help, it will. I, I uh, totally, totally agree. But let me uh, say that the, the, the Congress in, in the last year and a half uh, has passed two pieces of significant uh, legislation uh, that have direct impact uh, on the insecurity uh, and the, uh, uh, the uh, theft of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of resources from the Congo. Uh, one is the Dodd-Frank legislation, which addresses the issue of conflict uh, minerals. The other piece of legislation uh, is uh, related to uh, the uh, efforts of Senator Feingold and Congressman McDermott and, another, and others to uh, ensure that the U.S. government have a strategy uh, to deal with the uh, LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army, which has now been operating for most of the last two or three years in the eastern Congo and not in Uganda from uh, its original home. Both of these uh, pieces of legislation were passed with enormous bipartisan uh, support. Uh, and they both uh, speak to a need uh, uh, that can be addressed by some things we do. Uh, we uh, have taken uh, the concern uh, about conflict minerals seriously. Uh, and uh, while we have uh, not been able to do as much on the ground as we would like, we certainly uh, have called the attention of this problem uh, to uh, the supply chain uh, and to the end users. Uh, this is an, an issue that Secretary Clinton has taken uh, a personal uh, concern in, uh, about. And we in the department uh, have uh, uh, convened on at least two occasions in the last six months. Uh, most of the uh, major uh, importers of uh, materials from the eastern Congo that go into our computers uh, and our cell phones. Some of the industry <coughs> representatives who attended uh, this meeting, and they represented a large spectrum of the well-known uh, consumer brand companies, probably could not have identified North or South Kivu, Goma, or Bukavu, and in fact probably did not know uh, where all the, the minerals that Ben just talked about came from. But they do know, uh, and we have made them aware, uh, that they have to uh, know uh, the origin of their, uh, their, their uh, materials and that they are coming from conflict zones, uh, and that there will be increasing pressure placed on them as a result of the law and, and public scrutiny about uh, where they are sourcing their materials. This was a wake-up call for many of them, but we're uh, committed to working with industry, with their supply chains, 
to make them aware that much of what they're using in cell phones and computers is coming from conflict areas and coming from areas uh, that are under the control of both mafia soldiers uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and rebel groups. The other is the LRA. Uh, just last week, uh, President Obama uh, signed and sent to uh, the Congress uh, an administration strategy document uh, on uh, the U.S. effort to uh, uh, help uh, uh, capture uh, and eliminate the threat that the LRA uh, poses to the Eastern Congo. Uh, that is quite an elaborate strategy, and I suspect that at some point uh, it will be made uh, public uh, by the committee uh, that uh, received it. And it, in fact, outlines uh, clearly uh, what we are doing. We take it very seriously. Uh, I can say just even today, uh, again, participating in a, in a meeting in which we outline new initiatives uh, to, to help deal with this problem. We are committed to working with the Ugandan government uh, to track down uh, the LRA uh, in the Congo uh, and in the Central African Republic. Uh, we have uh, been one of that country's largest uh, financial and technical supporters. Uh, we uh, will continue to support uh, the Ugandan uh, effort as long as it remains serious and robust as long as their troops uh, continue to do as they have over the last two and a half years, uh, behave and protect the, uh, the, uh, the, the civil liberties of the communities in which they're operating, and as long as they have, as they have done, received the support uh, of the governments uh, in which their troops are operating. Uh, we have also indicated uh, that we are prepared to increase and augment uh, our support not only uh, to the Ugandans, but also to help uh, the regional states to build their capacity to deal with the LRA. So uh, in both of these uh, two pieces of legislation, uh, bipartisan uh, in nature, uh, are critical uh, in, in helping to shape uh, the strategy that we're using to go forward and to uh, assist uh, in a problem which is uh, significant, but we're committed uh, to working on. Can I just say one, yeah. uh, one quick thing, which is that in all truth, I have found that it's a tremendous amount of bipartisan support for this issue, and I'm grateful for it. And uh, in a, a probably, and unfortunately, a rancorous uh, time, you know, maybe this is something that folks can agree on, and perhaps that will, uh, will help us. And I also want to highlight there has been a lot of really good work, um, John Prendergast, the Enough Project, working around conflict minerals, who, who are doing uh, an, an extraordinary job on that. So I just wanted to uh, point them out. Well, speaking of uh, bipartisan congressional uh, support, our uh, keynote speaker, Senator Kerry, has arrived, so I'm going to wrap up the panel. I think, uh, I think the panel has conveyed, A, the complex complexity of the issue. I tend to think we come away from panels uh, on, on DRC uh, somewhat gloomy, um, but I think we've highlighted also the progress that has been made, the opportunities that there are moving forward. Uh, the, the size of the audience today, I think, speaks volumes um, to the attention. Uh, ben, the ECI initiative, uh, bringing additional attention, congressional support, and really an investment in the resilience and the, uh, of the people of Eastern Congo, who I hope um, will remain a central, uh, a central focus uh, for us as we move forward into the coming election year. Uh, we're going to leave it to a fellow of Massachusetts to introduce the senator. Okay. Uh, the panel will step <coughs> down, and um, thank you uh, to again to Mvembe, Tony, and Assistant Secretary Carson. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I, uh, this is very exciting for me and uh, something I've actually had the honor to do uh, once before, but it's always uh, lovely. It's my great pleasure to, to introduce a man who has fought physically and intellectually for uh, the causes he believes in. He has defended America abroad. Uh, he has worked with the U.S. government, for de within the U.S. government for decades to make her policies smarter and more effective. Uh, he's uh, 
He's an extraordinary guy. I've seen him face uh, adversity up close. I admire him. Uh, I believe he's an exquisite example of uh, who we might aspire to be in, in, in public service in this country. Uh, he also happens to be from the great state of Massachusetts, which uh, does not hurt. Um, we welcome his thoughts on Congo, Africa, and, and America's interest in the stability of the region. Please help me in welcoming the uh, senator from the great state of Massachusetts, my home state. Well, Ben, thank you very much. Uh, we took it on the road in 04. We should do it again sometime. <laughs> I, I wait till that gets tweeted around. Oh, you know, <laughs> Kerry announces, I accept the nomination. <laughs> anyway, let's not, let's not get carried away, right? Or let's, who knows? Uh, but it's great to uh, be here, and it's especially nice to be introduced by my fellow member of Red Sox Nation, uh, a great fellow traveler on this uh, journey of what I call accountability and of hope and of possibilities. And I really appreciate and have enormous respect personally for Ben's uh, contributions, uh, witness the number of folks who are here today, uh, the important dialogue that you've just had, uh, and the focus that he has been able to bring to a place uh, where much of what is happening that is so bad and so difficult happens because it doesn't get the kind of focus that it deserves and needs. So Ben's intervention, frankly, and the intervention of others, uh, John Prendergast and others, is just uh, you know, a godsend in a place where there's a kind of daily hell for too many people, uh, which the world doesn't notice going on at all, uh, or too little, I suppose I should say, particularly after the comments we just heard on the uh, panel uh, so I'm grateful for this opportunity to share some thoughts, and I noticed in the introduction that Ben mentioned uh, not just the Eastern Congo, but sort of Africa uh, and the region. And the region obviously also includes uh, a place called Darfur in Sudan, where Johnny Carson knows we are deeply involved right now in trying to live up to the promise of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, the CPA, and avoid yet another catastrophe where another two million people died in the longest war in Africa's history. Uh, a little known fact, most people think exclusively of Darfur, uh, where we lost 300 to 450,000, but two million people were lost in that longest war. And the capacity for difficulties over a place called Abiyé, 60 miles squared of territory, to reignite uh, that kind of conflict are unfortunately all too real. Uh, the efforts of the administration, of uh, Special Envoy Gratian and Ambassador Princeton Lyman, who is on the ground there now, and of uh, President Thabo and Becky, all laboring hard uh, to try to find the magic threading of the needle that will uh, successfully bring about a referendum on January 9th, uh, and whatever those results bring, and hopefully the completion of all of the other issues that are outstanding with respect to the comprehensive agreement are critical. So I just wanted to mention that in the context of this gathering as you think about this Eastern uh, Congo initiative that has come forward here. Uh, ben, you couldn't have found a, a cause more in need uh, of attention and more in need of public discussion. Uh, and where more lives can be saved perhaps faster than in a lot of other places if there is just that decent amount of international focus and attention. I want to thank each of the other panelists as well for their work uh, on this issue. Secretary, Assistant Secretary Johnny Carson has been just an indefatigable, long-time uh, committed leader on these issues. His career in shaping U.S. policy in Africa to promote peace and security, uh, to improve governance, create economic opportunities, uh, is well known. Uh, and so well known, that's exactly why he's doing what he's doing now. And we're lucky to have him there uh, doing that. Uh, and Vembe and Tony, thank you so much for uh, 
uh, being here, and I wish I'd been able to hear your comments uh, earlier. There is nothing like coming in as a keynote speaker at the end of a <laughs> panel that you have no idea what was said. <laughs> uh, if you want to challenge folks, this is it. Uh, so uh, obviously I have the risk of being completely and totally irrelevant. Uh, but it's a risk I'm willing to uh, take on, obviously, either out of sheer chutzpah or stupidity. <laughs> uh, and John uh, Bozeman, it's great to, to be here with you and look forward to hearing your comments, too, and look forward to welcoming you and welcome, working with you uh, in the Senate uh, as we all engage next year. Incidentally, one of the reasons, uh, just total aside, one of the reasons I'm only just arriving here now is that uh, uh, Chris Dodd, a senior senator from Connecticut, just gave his farewell address. <clears throat> He's an old pal of mine, and I thought, and I think it was, very important to be there to hear what he said. But I will tell you, you got to go read it, every single one of you. Uh, Mitch McConnell stood up afterwards and said it may have been one of the most important speeches in the Senate uh, in a long, long time, and I think it was, because it really talked about uh, the dysfunctionality and the, the awe and power of the Senate when people apply themselves appropriately to the challenges. Uh, and it was full of possibilities and full of, uh, uh, I think, appropriate uh, admonitions to all of us, uh, those who've been there a while and those who are just coming in. Uh, it is a great institution when it works properly, uh, which it isn't now, but can. And mostly that depends not on rules and not on either party, but it depends on the individuals who are elected there and the choices that they make. So this is one of those kinds of choices. It really is. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the things that must have been expressed here, I hope it was expressed here, and I'm sure it's what brings Ben and many of you to this uh, CSIS uh, meeting, and I thank them for sponsoring uh, this gathering, uh, is really the, 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 sort of the possibilities of what can happen with a de minimis amount of appropriate capacity applied to this challenge, rather than the indifference that has too often characterized uh, our approaches. The truth is that uh, each year, Doctors Without Borders releases a list of the world's most neglected humanitarian crises. And each year, folks, the DRC is on that list. Uh, that says something about us, all of us. It says something about the international community, uh, and it says something about uh, our current humanitarian responsibilities of common sense and justice and conscience. Millions of people have died. Nearly two million people are now living in displacement camps driven from their homes by the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army, or by the uh, uh, FDLR, or the Mai Mai, or the Congolese Army itself, uh, or some combination of them, or some combination of lawless gangs, uh, often young people just running around, armed to the teeth, uh, and raised on violence. Uh, even in areas where there is no conflict, basic services don't exist. And that gives the Congo some of the highest mortality rates in the world. And yet, despite all of this, if you asked most people in the world, they wouldn't have a clue that anything bad is happening. As Ben wrote in the Washington Post uh, this morning, most people don't know that the Congo was the site of the deadliest conflict since World War II, and that people are still suffering and dying in the wake of that conflict. That's why the Eastern Congo Initiative is so important, because frankly, it's the first time those nine proposals have sort of collected uh, a specific public sense of mission uh, and of uh, what the possibilities are. So that's why the work that the ECI and CSIS and others are doing here is so important right now in this context. Uh, here in this room today, we all need to leave here with a better understanding 
of what our mission is over the course of these next months and of how achievable it is. And I hope that's come out of these comments. I think Johnny Carson was talking about some of the things we are doing. You know, there are some positives. There is sign of where you can make a difference and how you can make a difference. Uh, and the administration is already doing a lot to help. And on Capitol Hill, uh, we've done a few small things, not as much as I'd like to see happen. But as you know, earlier this year, we passed the conflict minerals uh, provision as part of the Wall Street reform. Uh, and that is very important. I was talking with John Prendergast earlier today, and we were sort of talking about how you meet the needs. And I think we both came to the conclusion that even if you up the, the intervention of forces, uh, you wouldn't really make that much difference. And, and, and in the end, the really biggest kick of accountability is probably going to come uh, through those people who have an economic interest that is conditioning behavior today. And so creating the ties between those valuable minerals that are in all of our cell phones and Blackberries and other electronic devices and the armed groups that profit from them, creating that nexus is critical to beginning to create the accountability that we need. I mentioned to John that I think, and Ben, I think we ought to take this you know, to campuses all across America. Every kid who picks up a cell phone ought to automatically be thinking, as they thought about a blood diamond, they ought to think about a blood phone. They ought to think about the connection. And that is an instant capacity to communicate. We ought to be able to get you know, Verizon and AT&T and those people to help put the messaging out that links people to this so that everybody, that's the best communication in the country today, because a lot of people aren't going to see it on TV, you know, completely self-selective nowadays. And, and so this is a way that we may be able to really instill in people the kind of accountability and response that spreads very rapidly through corporate America, who suddenly becomes aware that the people who consume are demanding a certain standard of behavior. And that standard of behavior means there is not going to be a casual looking of the other way with respect to responsibility for uh, the, uh, for the uh, linkage to the minerals. Uh, I think we have, you know, every time you get a text, every time you tweet, every time you uh, take a photo, whatever happens, people ought to have that kind of consciousness. And I think that will change the behavior of some of the folks who have facilitated uh, the violence. On Thursday, we were going to take up in the Foreign Relations Committee, but I think because of the Senate schedule, we'll probably have to delay it to next week, but we will take it up, the International Violence Against Women Act. Now, as all of you know, and I'm sure it was discussed here, the Eastern uh, DRC has been the scene of some of the most horrific crimes of violence against women and girls imaginable. Rape has been used as a consistent weapon of war. Uh, and intimidation in a region where there is neither basic security or rule of law is rampant. As social institutions have broken down, rape has become a simply commonplace horror. And the International Violence Against Women Act is not a cure-all to it. But it will require us to develop a comprehensive, individualized strategy for countries with significant violence against women and girls. And the strategies to prevent that violence and to end the impunity for the perpetrators of it and to safely treat victims. Now, under IVAWA, as it's nicknamed, the State Department is also going to have to determine what actions it can take immediately in response to credible reports of widespread violence against women and girls uh, such as the horrific violence we heard of in Lavungi uh, in August. And I fully expect that the DRC is going to be one of the very first countries that the Avawa strategy is going to wind up having a positive impact on. So these are crucial efforts, but ultimately, folks, uh, the violence that characterizes Eastern Congo is, is a symptom. Uh, it's a symptom caused by the weakness of local governance by the absence of security, and by the absence of rule of law. So you're really beginning at some pretty basic some fundamentals here. And, and if we continue to approach the problems of the Congo in a piecemeal fashion, I guarantee you, 
Nothing will change. You cannot ignore armed groups such as the FDLR, uh, but you also got to figure out why did they flourish? It's not that complicated. We all know this. We learned some of this in the Rwandan experience, one that President Clinton today says, my God, I wish we'd you know, moved on it sooner. Well, same thing here. I don't want to wind up and you don't want to wind up, particularly after having a conference like this where we're acknowledging the realities, and then come back next year and have it be the same realities and the same level of inactivity. Uh, we also have to be mindful of the fact that government forces have almost consistently been labeled the worst actors in this violence. And they have increasingly, the government forces, profited from the trade in minerals. The Congolese government simply has to, and we obviously have to work with them to do this, develop uh, a justice system that ends the impunity for those who commit vicious crimes, and we've got to ensure in, in, the, in the effort to do that, that the troops are paid, that the fundamentals of governance are occurring, and that they have basics like food and shelter, so they're not motivated to add to the problems that they're supposed to be solving. Now already, we are engaged in this. I don't know if Johnny talked about it, uh, but we're helping to professionalize the Congolese military. We have a training uh, facility in, in Kasangi, uh, Kisangani, where we're preparing what we hope will be a model light infantry battalion that can quickly deploy, particularly to the Kivus, north and south. And we need to do more uh, than that. We need to coordinate with other members of the international community. And we need to ensure that the UN mission in the Congo uh, has the means as well to help protect uh, civilians. Now, obviously, that's been a little bit complicated from President Kabila's sort of downsizing to some degree, but I don't think it's still one of the largest emissions in the world at some, I think, 18,000 or something like that. Uh, and so we ought to have that capacity. And we need to expand our humanitarian and development assistance, uh, both in the investment as well as in the breadth of territory uh, that we are addressing. And that's one reason why I very strongly support ECI's call to reappoint a U.S. Special Advisor uh, for the Great Lakes region, because it will significantly aid us in their ability to do that. So, uh, folks, we've seen how successful a regional approach can be. Uh, the U.S. supported Congo Basin uh, Forest Partnership, for example, is defined by a watershed rather than defined by geographic uh, lines, uh, specifically on a map. And the six African countries that make up the partnership are home to the second largest uh, tropical forest of its kind left anywhere in the world. That's an enormous resource that everybody has a stake in. Because the bottom line is the ecological future of Africa and our global efforts to combat climate change, something near and dear to my heart, uh, hang in that balance. And I highlight this uh, not just because I do have a specific interest in that global effort, but because uh, it really shows that many of the Congo's challenges are in fact regional challenges, and we have to see them as such and engage those regions in them accordingly. Uh, we also know that Congo's wars have been fueled by its neighbors, uh, and its future prosperity is going to depend on those neighbors as well. Now next year's elections are the first step in the big path forward. The DRC, as we know, just celebrated 50 years of independence. But for almost all of that half a century, folks, uh, it has been torn by war, by oppression, uh, and development has actually gone in reverse, with infrastructure disappearing and governance contracting. The next 50 years are up to us to define, to some degree, in the end, uh, I, I think if we're going to have a future that benefits communities, not just warlords, uh, and in which institutions of law and medicine and education are established, in which the DRC is not the world's most neglected crisis, but we've transformed it into the most dramatic place of change, uh, that's what we have the opportunity to try to do. What's interesting about it is, and I think Johnny would agree with me, 
you know, we're putting $106 billion a year into Afghanistan. More than a trillion went into Iraq. Uh, this is so small in terms of the monetary requirement and what would make a difference. So stunningly small, but so huge in terms of the dramatic impact it would have on the lives of fellow human beings. And frankly, uh, it would do America so much good uh, to be able to say to the world uh, that it's not just the war on terror and other kinds of things we care about, but it's this kind of humanitarian challenge that motivates us and excites us and challenges us and brings a whole generation into a new level of engagement that can transform, in the end, a whole continent. There aren't many places left on this planet where you can say that and where it matters as much. So I thank you for being here today. Uh, it is still one of the most neglected tragedies in the world. It has never received the global attention in proportion to the scale of its suffering uh, that it demands. And, and obviously, the complex, ever-shifting ethnic conflicts that are hard to understand make it easy for a lot of Americans to turn in the other direction. Life is already easy enough in America for people to turn in the other direction. We have to fight back against that kind of uh, predilection. Uh, I'm confident that we can do it. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the arguments that the ECI has made here today are common sense, achievable, uh, and they are the best path forward for us to be able to make the kind of difference that I've just described. So thank you for the privilege of sharing some thoughts with you. Most importantly, thank you all for being here today and for caring about this enormous challenge and mission that we have to engage in. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Kerry. Um, I just uh, so moved and touched and impressed. Guy does not um, uh, need to be here and, and lending his uh, powerful voice to this issue will, uh, is amazingly important and um, very impressive to me. I also want to uh, uh, thank Senator Bozeman, who's here. And uh, it's, it's uh, also very important that the, that the Senator has uh, shown up. I, like I say, I believe this is an issue that transcends partisanship. It's an issue about being a human being, who we are, what are our values as Americans, what do we want to leave behind, what do we want to say that uh, our government does on our behalf. And um, I'm extremely grateful to, to the Senator, and I look forward to seeing uh, you in the future and bending your ear about this endlessly. <laughs> uh, I, want to, uh, I want to thank my fellow panelists. Uh, I want to thank the Assistant Secretary. There he is, uh, uh, Johnny Carson. Thank you so much again. Somebody who's taking time from a very busy and important schedule, and it's uh, it's so important. Thank you. Um, it's it's been an honor to truly to sit on a panel with you. I keep reading about you in books, and now I know what you look like. Uh, uh, Tony Gambino, thank you. He's been a tremendous asset in um, putting stuff together. Worked tirelessly on this issue. Very smart guy and someone who really cares and an inspiration to me. And um, remember, thank you. I mean, you know, the, the voice of uh, truth and, uh, and, and insight and uh, a wonderful guy and always looks better than I do everywhere we go, <laughs> which is starting to become annoying. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, Dimitri and Salama, I want to thank you for authoring this paper that did a fine job. Um, for those of you real policy wonks, I expect it written, uh, read in the next couple of days. There'll be a test. Um, thank you very, very much. Please do look it over. This has been an honor. You know, CSIS, I, I'm incredibly grateful. And thank all of you, uh, as the Senator said, for, uh, for showing up. It means a lot, um, it turns out, you know, where you, what you show up for. So thank you.